Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland Days? And just want to start this episode off uh, thanking everyone who watches and comments on our videos. Uh, definitely have gotten tons of great feedback over these last couple of episodes about what we should or shouldn't do going into the draft, as well as the reviews of our draft that many of you have shared. Uh, always learn something from the comments. I think uh, I probably do tend to go for more well-balanced players. I mentioned in a response to one comment that I think I'll almost always take a player who's good at everything rather than someone who is great at three or four things, but below average or bad at a couple of categories and that might not be the best way to build a team i think particularly with the new development lab feature probably need to broaden my horizons a bit and think somewhat more holistically about what we can turn players into through the development lab that said, the development lab resources are also limited. Um, six spots is standard, and I'm only playing with eight. So you figure we're signing at least one, and often two, three, or four international free agents a year. And by definition, we've got three draft picks in the first three rounds every year. So there's a lot of players that... Uh, theoretically are competing for those eight development lab spots so uh, just something that I do think about and factor in um, I don't think you can draft only projects uh, because otherwise you'll run out of spots in your development lab and you really won't be able to develop them as you need but probably can uh, be a little more nuanced in the types of players that I bring on board and I also promise I will try to be more engaged with college players going forward. Definitely like the high ceiling of high schoolers, and my thought is uh, we invest heavily in player development. We invest heavily in a great coaching staff. If we purchase via the draft lots of high ceiling lottery ticket high school players, we're going to put enough of them through the system, and we're probably going to get a higher success rate than an average team on them. And over time, that's going to mean that we're going to develop some pretty big players. Has not quite happened yet. Three and a half years into this playthrough, but our farm system is getting stronger, is getting better, and is getting deeper. And hopefully we'll be able to supplement it a bit over these next two and a half, three weeks until we get to the trade deadline. I am in the process of scouting a fair amount of prospects, players who we could potentially get back in trades. Uh, it's going to take us a while to get through these guys, uh, but still we'll have enough time before the trade deadline, hopefully. So probably not going to be too much action over the next week and a half or so of this episode. Although we will be approaching the All-Star break and finding out our lone representative in the All-Star game. Because at 35 and 56, I am pretty confident we will not have multiple All-Stars this season. But once we do get past that, I'd like to extract whatever value I can from some of the veterans on our team and some of the players who aren't in our long-term plans. Doesn't seem like we're going to be picking up top 100 prospects for any of these guys, but if we get a decent body or two who can help us potentially down the line, I think I still have to view that as a victory. We have made one relatively minor trade uh, since the last episode. We traded away the veteran outfielder Greg Allen, who the Twins were looking for, Cole Miller, a 22-year-old, very mid-pitching prospect, and Jonathan Yan, a 24-year-old, quite honestly, in my opinion, non-prospect corner outfielder. 
And we got back a 19-year-old minor league pitcher, Alfredo Guerrero. Doesn't look like he's going to be anything great. But he does have a good personality, high work ethic, enough stamina to start, potentially for average to slightly above average pitches and a profile that suggests he could be a decent fourth or fifth starter uh, if everything works out. Certainly no guarantees that he'll make it, but I think he's got the highest ceiling of any of the players in this deal, so though it's conceivable that uh, Guerrero will never pitch in the majors for the Oakland A's, I think there's a better chance that he will play for us someday than Jonathan Yan or Cole Miller ever would have. So from that perspective, um, a very small step forward, and quite honestly, I think these are kind of the trades that we're going to have the opportunity to make. I don't think we're going to get any superstar prospects, but we will try to be creative and see what happens over these next couple of weeks before we get to the trade deadline. And as this episode began, we were 35 and 56, uh, right on pace to lose exactly 100 games. Certainly would love to avoid that ignominious feat. Don't know how many games we're ultimately going to end up winning, uh, but we did just have our best stretch of the season over this final week before the All-Star break. Swept a series against the division rival Mariners, and then we took two out of three on the road against the Giants. So at this point, uh, despite the really rough season that we've had, we're somehow heading into the All-Star break with uh, eight wins in our last nine games and three consecutive series victories. Taking a quick look at the All-Star teams, as expected, only one All-Star for the Oakland A's this year, and it is a pitcher, Ben Leeper who we picked up in the Rule 5 draft, uh, 2-0 record, working out of the bullpen, 324 ERA over 50 innings. He's given up seven home runs. His whip is 1.28. Been well above average in terms of his ERA plus, a bit above average in terms of his fit minus, uh, but a war of just 0 0.3. So the fact that Mr. Leeper is our all-star this year, I think, says Everything that you need to know about how this season has gone for the Oakland Athletics. And we've split our first two coming out of the All-Star break, so the rubber game of this homestand against Detroit today uh, did just get some bad news. Uh, Daryl Hernay is going to be out with a torn PCL miss nine months or so, so he's going to miss uh, all of the rest of this season and uh, certainly a chunk of spring training and possibly the start of next year with this nine to ten month injury. Uh, hit 268 this year, 86 OPS plus, 82 WRC plus, half a win of war, so not quite as productive offensively or overall as he was a year ago. He is a guy who is um, set to head into arbitration next year, making $2.8 I think he's a guy that we can still afford to have back. I do like the fact that he actually makes contact and draws a few walks, unlike many players on our team. And he's still not making crazy money. Clearly, if uh, he was the missing link for us to be able to bring a top prospect on board over this next week. I wouldn't be reticent about trading him away, but I'm not necessarily expecting that we're going to be overwhelmed with offers uh, where he is the key to bringing a big-time prospect on board. And when life gives you lemons, at least if you're me, you try to make lemonade. It is a delicious and refreshing summertime beverage. And you may remember we sent Max Muncy down. He had been very unproductive in Oakland and also wasn't playing every day. He's been in AAA Vegas for close to a month at this point, and he's put up a 137 WRC+, plus, 
So with the injury to her nays, that should uh, ensure that we'll be able to give Muncie some more material major league playing time over the uh, rest of this season. And we ended up losing yesterday in extra innings to Detroit to uh, drop our first series coming out of the All-Star break. And uh, we're about to make a trade that will, uh, I don't even want to say bail on our chances for this year because we don't have any chances this year. We're 41-59. and 59. Uh, As I talked about, I'd really love to avoid 100 losses, and this won't help us with that goal. But uh, we are going to trade away the veteran pitcher, Gabe Spire, picked up on waivers a couple years ago. And uh, he's been respectable for us this season with a 388 ERA. But when it all adds up, he's been below replacement level over the last year and a half, set to make over $3 million next year in arbitration. Probably not a big part of our future. Anthony Santander set to potentially make $9 million next year if we exercise his team option, which we probably will not, given that he's going to be 33 years old shortly, and he's primarily a DH for us at this point. He's put up a 107 WRC plus this year, but that's been trending in a negative direction recently. He uh, averaged over 30 homers and over 100 ribbies his first two years with us, uh, still on pace to... Uh, approach 30 homers and 100 ribbies this year. Uh, definitely one of our more dynamic offensive players, uh, but not part of our future. And then we also have to include Arubio Fuentes, a 24-year-old uh, infielder who is not a big-time prospect. He's in high A ball this year. In return, we'll get Juan Aguiano, a 17-year-old right-handed catcher. Uh, did hit over 300 in a very small sample size in rookie ball this year. Like the personality with the high work ethic, looks like a competent defensive catcher. And if he fully develops, he could be a useful catcher. Um, certainly a backup with a little bit of pop in his bat and the ability to draw walks. And if everything went perfectly, he could be a borderline starting catcher. Um, so not a big-time prospect, but unfortunately, deals like this are about the best that we're going to be able to do. So we'll go ahead and complete that trade and uh, open up a couple spots for some more youth on our roster. And we've got another trade of veterans put together. Uh, Sean Manaya, who we signed to pretty high expectations this offseason, um, and he certainly has not met them going 6-10 and 10 with a 5.62 ERA. Now, as Sierra suggests, he's been a lot better than that, and he still has half a win above replacement despite his uh, headline numbers being pretty crappy. Uh, but we've got a team option for $5.5 million on him next year. He's going to be 36 years old before the season starts. If he had pitched better this year, he might be in our plans, but he's obviously not. Ian Hamilton, um, similar to Gabe Spire, uh, we picked up on waivers a couple years ago. He has been our closer uh, for most of this playthrough, having another solid year this season. Uh, set to be making over $4 million next year. He'll be 33 the middle of next season. Probably not a big part of our future either. And we're not going as young with who we're getting, uh, but it's still a guy who I think certainly is more of our potential future than either Manaya or Hamilton. That starting pitcher, Bubba Chandler, 24 years old, and he's got three years of experience. So he's arbitration eligible, and he's going to be making about $2.5 million next year. But we think his stuff could be a little bit above average, decent movement on his pitches, average control. He's got a four-pitch arsenal, decent stamina. Uh, he's on a rehab assignment, uh, but he's still normal as far as his injury proneness um, coming off of an injury. Started five games in 15 total games this year for Pittsburgh. Six and one with a 3.67 ERA. He certainly hasn't been great over the course of his major league career. 
been well below average in his ERA plus, a little better than average in his FIP minus. But he's having his best major league season this year. And as I noted, only 24 years old. Don't love that he's already in arbitration, but with the salaries that we're potentially taking off our books for next year and the team options for Manaya and Santander and then the potential that Hamilton and Spire would have been making more than Chandler anyway is certainly a guy that we could afford. I think he's probably a fourth or fifth starter on most teams. Might end up being a second or third starter for us, probably third behind Mason Miller and Clark Schmidt. Uh, but young enough that although he's probably not going to be with us if we are able to keep our job here and turn this team into a contender, I think he can help us be more competitive for the next few years. Like the work ethic that he has. Um, so since we're kind of tearing down what we can and just trying to grab anyone with a little bit of value, we're going to go ahead and make this trade too. We have to retain all of Manaya's contract and most of Hamilton's just because Pittsburgh was in such a difficult financial situation. Um, but we're going to go ahead and complete that trade. Chandler will obviously go right onto the major league roster and then we'll need to uh, head back down to AAA to find another pitcher for us. And we've got another deal. Uh, we're going to trade away Josh Spores, the 33-year-old reliever. Um, having a bit of a down year for us with a 5.45 ERA. Like his profile, but he is a free agent after this year. Not looking for crazy money, but $3.9 million a year for three years. Uh, for us, for a middle reliever, is probably a bit much. Also have to include... Um, Veteran minor league second baseman Kazuhika Mitsuanga, Chris Maldonado, and 19 year old Telma Bebule. Reminds me of the uh, Simpsons character Selma Bouvier. Uh, but he is not a big time hitting prospect at all. We'll get Jorge Ruiz, a 23 year old center fielder. Uh, Kind of looks like a 4A guy to me. He's um, not been incredibly productive this year in Salt Lake with an 87 WRC plus in AAA. But he is solid defensively. He's got a little bit of speed. He does make contact. Um, he's a guy who still has option years left. The more interesting part of the trade is left fielder Luis Taveras. Doesn't look like a big-time hitting prospect, but he's a right-handed hitting corner outfielder with a good work ethic, only 18 years old, soon to be 19. Think he could ultimately have plus power. Not going to draw a ton of walks. Um, got a lot of improving that he needs to do, but given that Spores is not part of our future and the other three guys are not either, we think we'll take a flyer on Mr. Ruiz and Tavares. And we just got offered a trade for first baseman Nick Prado, who's been in our Triple A team this year, hitting just 236. Does have 23 homers and 254 at bats. Certainly not a big part of our future. We've been offered um, reliever Justin Topa, who's certainly not part of our future. But the minor league shortstop, Kalen Culpepper, um, he's a guy with three option years left. He's going to be turning 25 this offseason. I don't think he's a big part of our future, but it does look like he could be a competent-ish bat. Don't love the low work ethic, um, but he's a younger player with options for a guy who's not part of our future. So I think we just uh, take the offer from the Twins and run with it. And as we sit here on June 29th, it seems like, or July 29th, it seems like we've about exhausted what we can possibly do in 
the trade market. Uh, we've got two games left in this month, both on the road against Seattle. Still might see some more offers from other teams, uh, but I think that uh, we've done about all the shopping we can do. We've done about all the wheeling and dealing we can do. We've brought in some younger guys into our organization. We've certainly weakened our team a bit this year by trading away some of those more proven veterans, but at 42 and 60, uh, we were never going anywhere this season. 60 games left, even if we play 500 ball the rest of the way, we're a 72 and 90 team, and I think it's pretty unlikely that we'll play 500 ball the rest of the way. And unfortunately, we lost both of our games against Seattle. Uh, so certainly, as I mentioned, going 500 the rest of the way was unlikely. And with an 0-2 start, it's even less likely. Uh, going to be tough to get this team to 70 wins. Uh, going to need to go 28 and uh, 30 the rest of the way to get there. So uh, that's going to be a big stretch for us to do and it would still represent our worst season here in Oakland. Our 42 and 62 record is a couple games below Pythagorean expectations. We actually did somehow salvage a winning record in July at 12 and 11, our first winning month of the season. So we'll take that as some small measure of progress. Uh, we rank 14th in the American League in runs scored still dead last in home runs which ownership wanted us to improve from 14th so they won't be happy about that 12th in the league and runs allowed so uh not a lot has gone right for these oakland a's this year hoping that um the draft that we put together is something we can build around for the future um, but i do have to be honest about the situation here um supposed to play 500 ball this year and we're going to not be very close to it ownership also wanted us to improve our home runs and uh, we're going to get worse have improved fan interest modestly since we've started and uh, technically we are just barely a sixth uh, top six farm system ranking sixth at least by this measure although by the other measure, we're still 11th, but we'll take the one that has a 6th. So uh, I don't think we'll get fired after this year, but it certainly is uh, not going to be a pleasant conversation with Mr. Fisher at the end of this season. And as we sit here on August 1st, uh, not surprisingly, nobody among the league leaders in the American League we are 26 games out in the AL West. We have the worst record in all of the American League. And we are only better than the Washington Nationals in all of baseball. So it's been a rough season. And we'll find out just how rough the last couple months of the year are in our next episode. And then after that, we'll find out whether or not we still have a job. <laughs> Until then... Thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.